Welcome to Champlain Presents, a showcase of work by seniors at Champlain College in the broadcasting program. I'm Mae Sullivan. And I'm Tyler Jennings Pasca. Champlain Presents is a showcase of work from broadcast seniors. These are documentaries we produced in a course about creating longer form stories for television. All of the topics were chosen by student producers, and we've got a range of stories. We'll take you behind the scenes at ski areas and meet some Vermonters who work the machinery and patrol the slopes. We go behind the scenes again, this time to an animal shelter, the Humane Society of Chittenden County, where staff save the lives of animals every day. We get into the world of YouTubers with a story about entrepreneurial content creators who play video games, make movies about them, and do it all for huge online audiences. Making glass. We have a piece about light and glass and the work of one guy living a life dedicated to his artwork. Making craft beer. We'll learn a lot about what's become the dominant industry in the state of Vermont. Meet beer makers, big and small, and see how the craft beer market is changing. Dan the Man. We'll give you the story of a cool guy, Dan Goodrow of Essex, Vermont, a young man with Down syndrome who advocates for people with disabilities. And now we begin with our first story about a very forthcoming guy, Marcus Pizer. Marcus is a teenager with a story to tell, and he's in a good place to tell it. Marcus is one of the co-founders of a home for transgender teens in South Burlington. Tyler Bradley knows Marcus and his family and asks them to take part in this story called Safe Harbor, Welcome Home. What does it mean to be transgender? Being trans is just being another person, you know? It's not something someone has to label themselves as. When children are born, gender and sex type are determined based on anatomy. People who identify as transgender would say they were assigned a sex that isn't true to who they really are. There's a surprisingly high number of transgender kids and teens who are rejected by their parents. Some even become homeless. Their families don't accept them, and they're just, you know, kicked out by their families for just being who they are. You don't know where you're going. You don't know, you know, am I going to make it to the age of 21? Like, am I going to make it to these milestones that people have because I'm so sad and I just don't feel like me? And to come and to have to tell your parents or your significant caretaker, I'm in a body that's not mine, this is not who I am, is one in and of itself like jumping the Grand Canyon because you don't know that reaction. That's why there are places young people can live with acceptance and feel safe at all times. Support of others is so big because, you know, who we are as people and our connections with other people is really strong in our lives, especially with family and friends. One home, one family, dedicated to trans teens in need of help. That message that Safe Harbor wants to say is it's safety above all else. Safety is the key. I am Marcus Pizer. And when I first started my transition, I was 16 years old. You know, I had always had a feeling that I was different. Like when I was little, I, I thought I was a boy, but I just felt so wrong and was sad and not comfortable with myself. Marcus was isolating, angry, um, didn't want us around, would be up on the computer all hours of the night. It became an, an issue of we needed the electronics and just really not wanting to talk to us and very angry. And it was that time that I was like, okay, like who am I? People are trying to figure out what they like and what, what sports they play. And I was playing sports with girls and I'm like, this is not who I should be running with. This is not who I should be passing a ball with. I really started to figure out, okay, this is not who I am. And we were really concerned that we were gonna lose Marcus. I hadn't like, really looked at what it was to be transgender because I had no idea that it was even a thing. I was like, oh God, that, that fits me. Like, that's exactly who I am. So I'd been sitting with that, trying to figure out how am I gonna come out with this? And finally, I, I told my therapist, and I was like, you need to turn around. I made him turn around so I could tell him, I've always wanted to be a boy, I think I'm trans. It was like a weight off my shoulders. It was the most freeing thing I think I had done. And when I finally told my parents as well, that was, that was a shock. They didn't really know at first. So Molly Ann Pizer was gender given name at birth for a female baby. And as Marcus transitioned and became male, we went to Marcus Finley Pizer. We love Marcus. 
But you have to realize for a parent, that also means it's a death of an, an individual in a way. And, and coming through the realization of Molly, who really wasn't with us, and probably wasn't with us for a long time, was gonna be put away forever. But then through extensive, it took me really six weeks of kind of going through almost like a mourning period to realize it's really the packaging, the soul inside is the same. Finally started my transition, it was 2015. It was January, I first started by cutting my hair. I didn't start big because I wanted to take it slow. I wanted to go slow and do it with my parents. And I'm realizing really there, there is no Molly, which I, I know that, but now I'm like, Molly's really gone. You know, I mean, there was some features in there where I could kind of look at Marcus and say, I see a little bit of Molly. But Molly's gonna be male with facial hair. And uh, that's, that's the transition. So I'm st we're still going through it. After a month or two, I went out by Marcus. I was starting to tell people I would like to be referred to as Marcus and have people put my pronouns as he, him. I remember in the lunch line, my picture was still my freshman year picture. So every time I'd put in their number, they're like, are, are you Molly? And I was like, uh, it's Marcus. And that, that can be a little hard, but it is rewarding in a way. It's, um, it's empowering to hear people use the right terms. My senior year, I first started testosterone on the 2nd of October. So I've been on testosterone for a year and almost five months. So that is a big difference with where I am now. Completely changes everything, my voice, my hair, my, my body. I just wouldn't change a thing. I've come so far. And to look over, you know, when I first came out and to when I started testosterone to when I got surgery, and just looking at all of those milestones, I just feel accomplished, I feel empowered. I realize the privilege that I've had to grow up in such a nice, in a nice town with such supportive people in Vermont. So I have just wanted to help other kids that have not been as fortunate as I have. So I came home one day from, from school and I was like, Mom, what can we do to help other you know, trans youth and adults in the community? What can we do to help people? because I have been so lucky, I want to help others that haven't. I want to be a supportive person in the, in the trans community, in the LGBT community. I wanted to honor that with Marcus because I thought that was a true statement. And that's kind of where Safe Harbor came about. After some consideration of what we wanted to do, we decided we would be Safe Harbor for trans teens. We decided first we'd start with foster care, so we were going to focus on trans youth for now. And we had to get certified as the you know, as a trans household that we can help trans youth and we were the first registered in the state. It gives them a resource to call. We do a lot of advocacy and we talk on advocacy, taking individuals at any given point. Once a month, I have a meeting which, with, in a room with 15 individuals that I have to say this person's not a possession. We are not a facility, we're a home. They need these supports. I work with their therapists. I work in all their medical, what they need medically to help them. A lot of people feel like they need some separation from their family because it's just such a heated thing, it's such a heated topic that when you come out, you know, you need a little space to separate, to regulate, and to let your parents kind of sit with something. I don't think we're on the street enough to actually get to the people who I feel are in the most dire need. We get them if they get picked up meaning that they wind up in custody or that someone gets our number. We get a lot of phone calls from youth or questions from grandparents or parents because they don't feel comfortable walking into the community of the LBGTQ. And that's why Safe Harbor is important is that you can be out in the world but still be isolated even among a crowd. It's nice to come home to like a full house instead of an empty one. You know, I'm, since my siblings are out of the house, I'm used to just having it be my mom, my dad and me and the puppies and cats. But with these kids, like one, we give them a safe home to live in and like also just support them in ways that I wouldn't imagine we could have. When I'm asked who is staying or who is with Safe Harbor, I'm so cautious and, and leery to answer the question because of a stigma. 
because I'm not the export, expert or is anybody else to exactly define who that is. They're human beings at the time who need to be loved, who need to feel safe, and they need to be who they are as people. Um, what do you give up personally? I can't run around my house in my underwear. What you gain is a lot of love and support, not just that we're supportive as, as a family, but it comes both ways, you know? Once we're all together as a community and we call ourselves a community, we call ourselves a family, there, there is a sense of you're never alone. Youth can stay at Safe Harbor as long as it takes for them to feel safe and ready to leave. It's not limited. Colleen Saniford is a registered nurse case manager from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont who has been working closely with the Pizer family and other transgender youth throughout Vermont. So when we found out from Blue Cross Blue Shield that there was somebody who dealt specifically with the transgender surgeries, that was amazing and a gift, but to get Colleen, I mean, she truly is a remarkable human being. There's a compassion level there that is beyond what her job is. Uh, my name is Colleen Sanford, and I'm a registered nurse and a certified case manager for our transgender members. Case managing transgender members is no different than case managing any of our members. Um, I think the reason to have one person is because of the sensitivity. We had called Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and, were, and my dad, he tells the story the same every time. You know, he was calling, and he's like, I have a feeling you have never heard of this before, that this is going to be completely new to you. He was dreading calling the insurance company to change the name of his son, and when he heard such a positive response and knew that he had a person he could talk to, a one person, to answer all his questions, they were so very appreciative of that. I think it's becoming better because the trans community is, is close-knit. They stick together. They talk to each other. Transgender has always been around. This is not a new thing. I think it's just neat being talked about more. And I think the more we talk about it and the more education, I think the more acceptance. Um, because there is so much violence and high suicide rates and murder rates of transgender people because people just don't understand. You don't take on that role and do it as eloquently and as caring if you're not a compassionate person, and that she is. Safe Harbor for trans teens is important because I think parents just, they have a difficult time, and it's, it's a grieving process for parents. They go through the denial, they go through the anger, they go through the fear, and so having a safe place like Safe Harbor for trans teens for them to go to and be supportive while the parents are working through those issues is helpful. You want to empower these youth. You want them to make them, to make them feel good and happy and safe. There is something about feeling safe and knowing that there's nothing wrong with you and you can go somewhere and be who you are, whatever that may be. I have a really amazing family and thankful for them to have them in my life and be there for me in ways that I couldn't imagine. And at first, I definitely thought they wouldn't be. I have gained such respect for Marcus um, that this is an individual who really has a lot to offer the world. And it, it's really within Marcus. Thank you so much, Tyler, for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, so we have to ask, what was it like doing such a long format documentary? Have you ever done anything like this before? I really haven't done a project quite like this before to this scale. I usually shoot videos like two, maybe three minutes, but this documentary was about 12 minutes long. And the production for it, I rented out light kits as well as two cameras per interview. 
So in terms of setup, it took quite a bit, and I was the yeah. only one on each shoot. Wow. So it was a lot of production, but I definitely got through it, and I learned a lot through the process. It was a great piece. Thank yeah, you. we all know the production struggle. Yeah, um, sure. So what made you want to choose the Pizer family? How did you come across them, and how did you like working with them? Yeah, I actually um, met Marcus when I was in high school, uh, Marcus Pizer, and the Pizer family actually is in my neighborhood. And I drive by their house every day, and I knew about um, Safe Harbor, but I didn't really know much about their story. And it really always interested me. So I kind of contacted them and let them know what I was doing, and they were more than happy to share their story. Wow, it was a great piece. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. A life with Down syndrome is one many of us not, may not know very well. But one young man from Essex, Dan Goodrow, is pretty much always willing to let people know what it's like. Dan and his father Lloyd are lifelong friends of Ryan Malley, one of the producers of this piece. Ryan and his partner Mac McDowell give us three distinct aspects of Dan's life and their story, more alike than different. Hi, my name is Dan Goodrow. I don't let Down syndrome slow me down. I have a full-time job. I like to play a lot of sports. I have two cats named Johnny Cat and Sadie. I like to play the piano and also the guitar. I always like making jokes. We are more alike than different. You know, my, my parents always made sure that I had access to musical instruments, so never forced me to play, but if I wanted to play, I could. Well, I took that same approach with Daniel when Daniel got a piano. I learned from my grandpa when I was little, he taught me how to play the organ when I was little. I didn't know what to do because I didn't have a piano before, but I know I know how to learn how to play my own song. continues to get better and better and better. I think Daniel's found something he really enjoys. So yeah, he jokes around, he says he likes to play and goof off and stuff like that. But really, when he spends his, his, his personal time, it's sitting at the piano. Music is just my talent. I always like to play and I never stop playing. My favorite musician is Johnny Cash, The Beatles. I like um, my grandpa Goody, and also my most favorite is Motown. I literally would consider him a subject matter expert on The Beatles. I mean, quite honestly, and that's no joke. Uh, he knows just about everything and anything you want to know about The Beatles. The most obscure stuff in the world he knows. I like history and music, though. When you see the history, I usually see what's happening in the past. So when you see in the past, I think of music. I think of music, I think of art. Because art is part of music. My favorite to do is to play music and make other people happy. I'm gifted, I like to play the drums too. But mostly, my disability is to make other people happy. And I also play the piano. I think my proudest moment, and his teacher shared with me that it was one of her proudest moments with Daniel is the baccalaureate ceremony at St. Michael's College. Everybody was asked to do something for that ceremony for his high school, and I don't think Dan, anybody had any expectations that Daniel would want to do something. And he put an application and said he wanted to play the piano. I said, oh my goodness. And he got up there and he played. He's funny as all heck because he sat down on the piano. And first thing he does is he got to get the knucklehead. He cracks his knuckles. Uh, and, and then he sits down and he plays, hey Jew, then I will tell you something. There wasn't a peep in that chapel while he was playing. 
And then all of a sudden people started going, da, la, and they started singing along. And he got a standing ovation. Daniel was blessed to be surrounded by very supportive people his entire life. And you have no idea what that means to mom and dad. I mean, it means the world to us because we always feared that Daniel would be bullied and, and picked on and stuff. But he was surrounded by a very protective group of kids. And, uh, and Daniel always had the blessing. He always hung around with the cool kids, which was cool. But at the end, after that performance, his teacher came up to me and she said, you know what, I gotta tell you, Mr. Goodrow, when Daniel put that piece of paperwork in to say he wanted to play, she accepted it. And we weren't sure, but she said, but she said I cried too. And to me, that was the most magical moment of Daniel's musical time when he got up there and did that. There's nothing like being at a special Olympics event. Sure, there are some great athletic accomplishments, but you'll never be more around a more positive environment. In tonight's Spotlight on Sports, we meet one young man who's using that positivity to make a difference. Well, first of all, I want to say Special Olympics. I describe it in one three-letter word, it's joy. It's important to me because it's part of my life. And always meeting new people, always meeting new friends. It's all about having fun with others. I'm always open-minded, having fun, being with friends and family, and also be a part of the team. Special Olympics has been very, very powerful for us. Again, not being an athlete myself, <laughs> you know, it's the far that I, I probably would not have exposed him to a lot of the stuff that he's been exposed to. He does soccer, he does basketball, he does swimming, uh, and he does uh, snowshoeing. And you know what, he does it all with excellence. My favorite event is swimming. My God, he's like a fish in the water. That kid can swim, I can't swim. All the favorite is soccer and basketball. And snowshoeing. I've never seen, I'd take three steps on snowshoes and, and I'd be flat on my face. Daniel runs in snowshoes and he wins gold medals in snowshoes. He pretty much is a jock when he gets right, right down to it, when he gets, does that stuff. I mean, the goal of Special Olympics is not whether you win or whether you lose, it's how well you play the game and just the opportunity to participate in the, in the experience of sports is huge with Special Olympics. It's up to me, I'm always having fun. I'm, it's okay to lose, but once you play hard, you win every time. But it's not always about winning. Sometimes it's about losing or winning, or listen to the coaches and learn to play right. Yeah, I think he, Daniel recognizes the abilities of others, and he helps others who may have lesser abilities than he does achieve. And I, I, I love that part of Daniel. You know, I don't think there's a selfish bone in that kid's body. And I think Special Olympics has taught him that. Because again, Special Olympics has, has, has exposed him to, to a group of people that Normally, you and I aren't exposed to. And I, that includes me. I mean, I, I, I love the Special Olympics community. I love being a part of that community because, I guess I've said before, oftentimes it's a forgotten community, but it's a very important community. And I think each and every one of us in our life have something to learn from that community. 
And Special Olympics is a shining example of that. It's not enough to be a great Special Olympian. Daniel Goodrow wants more. All the time, yeah. <laughs> the 17-year-old Essex High School student is an advocate for special needs. His last stop was in Washington, D.C. back in February, meeting with Vermont's congressional delegation. I love the fact that Daniel advocates because it, it says he has, his, he has his own being. and He has his own dreams, he has his own beliefs, and his own self-esteem, and uh, he stands up for what he believes in. I am part of a movement called Special Ed in the Woods. The old it is a scientific name for a tradition. You know, we're trying to send a real strong message to people that that word is hurtful. Michelle Gates is referring to the inappropriate use of the word retarded. Advocates say it's all about context. Medically speaking, mental retardation is still a diagnosis, but the R word has morphed into a mean slang word. It's important to spread the word because I have so many friends with special needs like me. And I choose to stand up and stand in the hour. You know, Daniel's got a message that needs to be heard. And you and I can't necessarily express it for him. He should be able to express it for himself. And the fact that he does express it for himself, I think should serve to inspire others that, you know, we all have our own abilities and our own ways of doing things. Take advantage of what you've got and do it. You know, you're no less an individual than anybody else just because you have Down syndrome or autism. You know, you have your own thoughts and your own passions. You should have the ability to express them. And I'm really proud of Daniel for wanting to express them. Do I like that I have Down syndrome? No. Do I like that not me? No, I do not. Let that stop me. I have ex accept who I am and that I am different. But you know what? We're all different, so that makes me the same as each and one of you. We're all different. It's okay, you can do this. You can do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. Well, Daniel can do some things that you can't do. Daniel can light up a room faster than that, just by a smile, or just by saying something gooberish or silly. He can really make a room respond. And I said, you know what that makes us? It doesn't make us disabled, it makes us all differently abled. Now when you think of Daniel as differently abled as each and every one of you are, it puts us on the same playing field. We're all differently abled. So if we put ourselves on the same playing field, let's leave that as a starting point and move up from there. Thank you so much for coming. My mm, pleasure. Yeah, thank you. So your piece was amazing. We want to know what the inspiration was for this documentary. I've had the pleasure of growing up with Dan, and personally I've always been inspired by his story. He's accomplished so much, whether it be musically participating in the Special Olympics or advocating for Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and he has actually made a huge difference for a cause he cares deeply about. That's great, and it shows. Yeah, and I personally didn't know Dan before getting to work on this piece, and it was really interesting not being exposed to Special Olympics and R Word advocacy. So getting a glimpse into that was really interesting and enlightening. I'm sure. It's amazing. Yeah. So the Goodrow family was a really big part of this piece. What was it like to work with them? To be honest, the Goodrow family was amazing to work with. Uh, both Dan and Lloyd were um, amazing people to interview. They were so helpful with getting us any information or any uh, pieces of pictures or anything like that that we needed. So it was a real pleasure getting to work with them. And Dan's a real funny guy. <laughs> definitely a fun guy to work with. Yeah. Definitely a jokester for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks so much for coming, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Your piece guys. is amazing. Thank yeah, you thanks for having us. If we went back in time 10 years, a lot of people would be surprised to think that craft beer would become the number one industry in Vermont. But that's exactly what happened. May and I produced this story together. May had an internship at the Vermont Brewers Association, and that got us interested in the competitive, quickly changing beer scene. Here's our piece. What comes to mind when you think of Vermont? Is it the cows in the countryside? Maybe skiing, maple syrup, or sharp cheddar? There's something else that in the last five years or so has become strongly identified with the Green Mountain State, and for a good reason. 
Vermont is a hub for a homegrown product that now represents the state's largest industry of more than $250 million annually. It's craft beer. These are the stories of those who are dedicated to the craft. Many people appreciate a delicious glass of cold craft beer, but making that beer is harder than it looks. Brewers of Vermont typically start as home brewers, trying to perfect their creations for people to enjoy. The hard part is making their unique products known and readily accessible. The question of oversaturation comes up a lot, and if you look at the model in Europe where there is a brewery um, in every community, um, literally sometimes in, on every corner, and that market's not overly saturated, it's about finding your community brewery. The National Brewers Association um, economist fully agrees with that and doesn't believe that there is a bubble that's going to burst anytime soon. There's still a lot of room for growth. It's challenging for the small startups because they have, there's a finite number of tap handles in the state, and there's a finite amount of shelf space, and so they are battling to get their name out, to get their product known, and then to share that shelf space and to get a tap handle at some of the craft beer bars in the state. They need to get a distribution permit or license either for themselves or they need to sign up with a distributor. So there's costs associated with that. And getting their, getting their name out when there's so many other wonderful products. You know, one of them joked to me last, last week that they feel invisible right now. And what can they do to, to get their name out in front of people? And that's part of what the association is here to do, is to help those smaller startups market themselves, get their name out in the um, get their name out in the community so people know that they exist and that their product is good. People don't win awards for anything other than quality. So Vermont is making very high quality beer. That's why we've gotten the national and international attention we have. That's why beercations are real things. That's why millions of people are coming into tap rooms every year. It's why our industry is $376 million worth of economic impact. We have exceeded maple syrup in their economic impact and we've exceeded the on-mountain ski industry. Craft beer is a force to be reckoned with here in Vermont as it relates to tourism, for sure. Vermont brewers work hard to stand out in the market. It turns out Canadian brewers are doing the same. Farnham Ale & Lager, a brewery originated in Quebec, opened up their second location in Vermont. Uh, so Farnham up in Quebec started in 2013. Um, craft beer is not a big thing up there. So when they happened, they, kind of, they exploded. They were big really, really fast. I think they are the eighth biggest brewery in Canada. My boss wanted to bring his beer to the US. Um, he's very, he loves Maine, so that was his first thing to go to Maine. Um, and he was packing an 18-wheeler and bringing the beer down to Portland, I believe. And the amount of money he spent getting it across the border and the exchange and everything like that, he wasn't making any money. So he wanted to have a brewery here. So he heard that Infinity was selling. So we bought out that space while this building was being built. And we just kind of let Vermont influence the Quebec beer that they already have. So our our recipes are similar in some cases, but others it has the twist because they like their maltier beers. We're definitely hop based, so we kind of just let Vermont influence the Quebec recipes. For Vermont brewers, it is important to understand what the market wants to drink. Farnham is targeting the beer lovers who are looking for something that is getting harder to find in Vermont, easy drinking beers. I think we do simple beer really well. Um, we don't necessarily do all the funky stuff, but we have beer that's reliable, that's easy drinking, and I think a lot of people appreciate that because sometimes you can get lost in all the, the unique beers and you just want a solid beer to drink that's local. So I think we do that pretty well. Vermont brewers are all trying out different styles and tastes in order to stand out in the industry. All of these styles, however, can be overwhelming. I think eventually it's going to get to the point where there are too many. And I don't think people are going to lose interest, but it's already getting to the point that new breweries, you don't hear about them as quickly because they're, you're just so overwhelmed with the amount as, as it is. 
it's gonna, there's gonna be a breaking point. I was talking to um, one of the gentlemen from the DLC and he was looking at the trends even the past 15 years, how you know wineries were a thing and then distilleries and now craft beer. And he says everyone reaches the plateau. In an industry where you can only have so many, tap lines can be hard to come by. Many breweries have their own way of distributing their beer and getting people into the tasting room. But in many retailers where it is pay to play, Brewers have to work a little harder to get featured. We're not trying to be the next alchemist or Hill Farmstead or anything like that. We're just going to do our thing and people, I think, appreciate that. Our, our main goals, I always say, are to be affordable, accessible, and drinkable. So that's kind of the motto we're trying to go with. Breweries in Vermont range from garage homebrew systems to large-scale breweries that produce hundreds of thousands of gallons per year. Magic Hat, based in South Burlington, is one of those breweries. Um, so Magic Hat Brewing Company started in 1994 by two gentlemen, Alan Newman and Bob Johnson. Uh, we started on a spot on Flint Ave, moved to this current location on Bartlett Bay Road in 97, um, and are currently producing about uh, 120 to 130,000 barrels of beer a year. The Vermont craft beer market is, uh, we're spoiled, for, for lack of a better term. Uh, there's uh, a plethora of super talented brewers who are doing a lot of different things um, and so there's no shortage of good beer anywhere. Um, on top of all the great things everybody is doing, it is a very welcoming community. So um, lucky enough to be friends with a lot of the guys from the other breweries, worked with them, worked under them, trained w under them um, and uh, it's, a, it's a nice community of people who are all looking to help each other out to elevate what we do uh, as a whole. Uh, the challenges of the Vermont craft beer market are that uh, it is pretty full. Um, I wouldn't say saturated, but uh, you know, for a state with only 600,000 people to have, I think there's like 60 something operating breweries and another 10 to 15 in planning currently. Um, so it's a uh, there's a lot of competition, um, but it's uh, it will breed better things. Um, you know, quality is going to be paramount as it as it all pushes on, um, and uh, so it's full. But we make it work. Magic Hat is also partnering with 20 bars and restaurants around Vermont for their Vermont Only series. Magic Hat creates special limited release beers for these partners that have given Magic Hat the opportunity to grow. Uh, we're working on our five barrel system, turning out um, about one beer every month. Um, and each restaurant is getting a keg of that single beer that month and then that's it. Um, so it's a chance for us to really give back to the community that allowed us to grow and become uh, kind of the, the, the bigger brewery that we are. Um, and also, a chance to to thank some of the people that continually push the beer scene in the area through those bars and restaurants. Um, they're they're very critical partners for all of us breweries, and uh, it's very exciting. Uh, we have a pretty unique struggle um, in the the Vermont market as uh, as a whole. Um, you know, we've been around a lot longer than some of the other the other breweries, and uh, so. Uh, as we've we've grown and become successful, it's uh, it's almost a, a slight negative take uh, in the eyes of Vermont. Um, Vermont has always had a very strong uh, support local culture, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and as much as we are bigger and we're owned by a parent company now, uh, we still employ 50 people, 50 or 60 people here at the brewery, with another 20 to 30 offsite um, doing graphic design and and. Uh, marketing work so um, you know we're owned by a bigger company but we still uh, we still brew beer here we still love the fact that uh, we were able to grow in Burlington and uh, we plan to stay for as long as we can I know you had a lot of experience with beer, working yes. at the VBA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely a beer drinker, I like beer, but I didn't know half as much 
as I learned when I started this. Mm -hmm. It was right. very like a lot of a lot of big, really big learning experience. Yeah, for definitely. Me. I think a lot of people don't know that there's a difference between liking drinking beer and being in the craft beer industry, and it's a very big difference. It's a really hard industry, um, but it was a little bit challenging at some points. Just um, the white noise of the brewery, you know, oh, yeah. their production is just mm -hmm. noisy sometimes. But it was a really fulfilling experience. Yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. um, and another, our next piece is centered around centered around another growing industry yes, in Vermont. Yes, definitely. Vermont is filled with artists, and there's a particularly strong interest here in glass art. One of the reasons glass pipes are quite profitable, because glass artists have a way to make a living. That's led to a growing market. Eric Schlossman introduces us to the work of one glass artist and his passion for what he does in a story called Looking Through Fire. I'm Stephen Rhodes, I'm 26, I'm a glass blower, in, uh, born in Boston, but I've been living in Burlington, Vermont for almost a decade. I was always an artist, uh, so I guess it was really just finding the medium um, that drew me in. I mean, not gonna lie, I was definitely a collector of glass uh, before I was a glass blower, uh, but I was an artist long before I, have, I even knew what uh, a piece was. <laughs> What's my favorite thing about glass? Uh, possibilities, that's definitely, that's definitely up there. Uh, the amount that you can do with it as a medium, you know, and with it by itself as a medium. I can build a wooden sculpture and paint it, but I'm using wood and I'm using paint and we really can do anything. The industry is super young and every day I feel like we see innovation uh, come out of the community. So I took a year off of school, I went back home to Boston and I annoyed the shit out of a glass blower. Uh, enough till he brought me on as a teaching assistant. I didn't get paid uh, but I could work for free. I worked there for about a year, came back up to Burlington, worked as a production artist for the Burn Gallery uh, for about a year and a half and then decided I needed my own place um, and I needed some more freedom. So I built uh, my first studio in Williston, uh, Vermont, uh, by myself. Uh, I was there by myself for, for a while um, and uh, it grew and at one point we had 10 artists working there. Uh, my very first that personal torch is right here. I keep it by me all the time, <laughs> at all times. It's always within arm's reach. Um, no, this is actually my first torch in all seriousness. It just happens to be under the bench right now. Um, I loved it. It was great. Very, uh, very rough mechanically. Uh, it's not as fancy or complicated as some of the professional torches that we use now. Uh, but it got the job done. And I made a lot of really awesome stuff on that, on that bad boy. Um, they last forever. I mean, it's like it's like a good car. If you just keep, you know, take care of it and clean it, clean it regularly, it will last forever. And that's why I still have it. Some head shop owners, some gallery owners, just aren't going to like your work, um, and you're not going to change that opinion of them. So you develop a relationship. If they want to buy your work, you sell them your work. Uh, after that relationship, you know, is, is, is strong, you can call, you can email, usually just make sales uh, through those means. Uh, and it's happened to me. You can, you know, sell glass really well in a certain area. If the head shop owner doesn't like you, they're not going to buy your glass. We get to create our own schedule. You know, we're make, we're creating, we're making art, uh, and paying our bills, which you couldn't ask for uh, anything more. An, unexpe an unexpected perk um, 
the challenge, and I know that sounds weird as a perk, but it's really challenging. Like it's, it's honestly probably one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. Because when you fail, when you fail, I mean, you, you pay for that failure. You know, emotionally, uh, you know, financially, you know, and, and as an artist, you're always torn between trying to find yourself and trying to find a paycheck, which is the hardest challenge I think you can face uh, in any form of employment. Do I enjoy what I'm doing? Can I make enough money to do that? And I, I needed somebody to hold down jerseys become too Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, what did you like most about shooting glass blowing? I really, I really love shooting glass blowing because there's so much happening. There's emotion, there's light, there's all sorts of different colors. You've got orange light coming from the flame, you've got blue light from the like actual flame. Everybody's wearing these dark, dark reflective glasses are really fun to shoot at. There's lots of glass everywhere, which is super fun to get light through. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's just everything's it's always different nothing you're never shooting the same thing every day so I mean people make things the same way but you're never they're never making exactly the same thing and so it's all it's always a new process sounds like a very creative topic love it I love shooting it um, I love I love blowing glass as well but I think mostly shooting it was the most fun mm -hmm. it was a very yeah. beautiful piece thanks yeah thanks Eric thanks for being here thanks for having me mm -hmm. there's a harsh reality in the US about dogs and cats because of overbreeding and commercial pet sales, there's overpopulation. That leads to extraordinarily high numbers of animals that are put down every day. But shelters like the Humane Society of Chittenden County do a lot to save the lives of pets and get them adopted. Katie Bullock and Dylan Stade met the people at the shelter and some of the animals who stay there for just a while. Their piece is called A Second Chance. It's a temporary home. Every year, about a thousand lives come here for hopefully a short stay. So we're really lucky we have a lot of people who come through our doors already having an animal in mind that they want to adopt. Adoption is the mission. This is a place dedicated to giving dogs, cats, rabbits, and smaller animals a future. Maybe animals don't have to have a forever home or the perfect home. Um, it could just be the right home at the right time for the right amount of time. I just love helping animals that don't have a voice of their own and giving them a voice. The place that gives pets a voice, where they have a home and find a home. This is the story of the Humane Society of Chittenden County in South Burlington, Vermont, a shelter where animals get a second chance. Meet Melanie, a small gray cat from Vermont. Melanie was five years old when she was brought to the Humane Society. Melanie came to us um, because her family couldn't care for her anymore because they were moving. That's a really common um, reason why people give us their animals. She did have um, severe sign of fleas, so she had a lot of like skin um, scabs and hair loss when she first came to us, so she was treated right on intake, obviously, to make sure that she was comfortable because that's as you can imagine, pretty uncomfortable. Melanie was in the one in the middle, I remember, and there was two others on the side, and she was tucked back away and under the covers and didn't want to be seen or touched or anything. And we asked if we could hold her and uh, pet her and play with her, and they said yes. <laughs> and so we were holding her, but she really was just super shy. So it was hard to get her out of her shell, but obviously it didn't matter because she was adopted pretty quickly. Being there must have been super stressful for her. And I think we felt sympathetic with that and we knew she needed a good home so we decided she was the one and we took her home that day and we um, got her a bed and um, made food bowls and toys and pampered her all the way so <laughs> it was a fun day. <laughs> a good beginning for one pet owner and one cat but it's not always so easy. 
The challenge for the Humane Society of Chittenden County is to make it possible for many other animals to find homes. Erin Alamed has been the Director of Volunteer and Community Outreach at the Humane Society since 2015. There's so many homeless animals out there that, you know, some of these animals have been with their owner for nine years and their owner pa passed away. So, you know, these animals are just looking for a loving home and they're already, some of them are already just pre-trained and um, beautiful and awesome and they have such great personalities. So I think it's much better to, it feels better in my mind to adopt and save a life rather than to purchase. The Humane Society works because people help animals. There are 15 staff members and as many as 200 volunteers. Do you have your ear? I think we probably do a lot more than people may know about. The goal here is to make a good match. Uh, so what we want is not only for, let's say, Hercules to be successful, but for the person equally. The Humane Society takes in just over a thousand animals per year. It's not uncommon for many of these animals to be adopted, but later brought back to a shelter. The family can't afford um, to feed them anymore. Maybe there's a lot of uh, medical expenses. Maybe they're moving. Maybe they've lost housing. Um, so really, those real life, you know, reasons that um, people just run into, um, and they just need to give up their animals. Un unfortunately, it's very sad. Um, so that's that's number one. And obviously, we adopt those animals out. A lot of people think, and I'm guilty of that myself before I started working here and volunteering, um, that the reason we had these animals, were, they were abused and they were you know, mistreated and neglected and these people are terrible for giving up their animals, but um, at the end of the day, these people are just trying to get by. And that if they have to move on for whatever reason, that is what we're here for. So to judge someone on that, wouldn't really align, you know, with our mission. One thing that helps a lot is the internet, an effective way for people to view pets before they've even walked into the shelter. We looked at the website a lot and would see the cats that were coming in and getting adopted and the ones that maybe were staying longer because they were older or a lot of times people don't like to adopt fat cats so we were looking for fat ones. So they sign in and fill out an adopter profile which is just a front page of a sheet asking a few questions about you know their lifestyle and what they're looking for, do they have animals at home. Why you want to adopt and things like that. And so we had submitted that before, so they knew we wanted to adopt already. And then you have to come into the shelter to meet them in person. That's really important. We went to the Humane Society the first time and just looked at the cats. And you get to go into the rooms and hang out with them and feel if it's a match, I guess. Um, and you talk to the people and explain your interest in them. And it was so hard to leave every time because they're all so cute. The third time we went back, uh, I feel like we both kind of knew like it was going to be the day that we came home with one. We really want this animal to go home, so if it's a good match, we will push it through. Ruby came to us in January as a stray. Stray dogs that are found in our area actually go to um, the ACO, so the um, animal control officer of that town, so they go to the police station. She's about three years old that we found. Um, she is on a special diet. She has some skin issues as well. Um, she has high energy, so she needs hiking and, you know, fetch and a lot of um, interaction because she also needs her mind to kind of work too to tire her out. So um, we need a good home that has a lot of activity in it. Sometimes they are here for a longer period of time. We've had a dog here for over a year before, a cat for nine months before. And we are an open adoption facility and so we look for every reason to say yes. And we like to answer any questions that people have about the animal um, so that they really know that you know it's a good fit for them or not. We really work towards um, not contributing to the overpopulation of pets. Um, and so if you adopt, you're not only helping with this issue, but you're giving a second chance to the animals in need who need a second chance and a new home. Many animals get shipped to New England shelters like this one. Staff here say southern states tend not to have strong spay-neuter programs and get saturated with homeless animals. And whenever there's an overpopulation of pets, 
there are decisions about life and death. So when you have a hundred dogs coming in a day and you don't have anywhere to put them, you don't have a choice but to euthanize for space. We don't have that problem here. We don't euthanize for length of stay or space ever. So um, if we can help those shelters in the south, that we will. Um, and we have been doing more transports um, as the years have passed. We're now doing two to four a month. The Humane Society will only euthanize an animal under special circumstances. We're trying to change the lingo because it can't be no kill. It's just a, it's a false statement because the only two reasons that we do euthanize an animal is for uh, medical reasons um, and then the other is behavioral. You know, the last thing we want to do is put a dog or cat out there that is very dangerous. I wouldn't want to keep, you know, a really stressed out dog here that nobody could handle or touch um, who was maybe dangerous just to, to say that we didn't ever euthanize. Melanie, the small gray cat from Vermont, was lucky enough to get a second chance. I feel like it's common knowledge that it's just better to adopt from a humane society or a shelter of some sorts because the situations that those animals come from are sometimes more intense and just more urgent and there's more of a need for families to adopt rather than going to a pet store and going to pet stores also supports breeders and gives money into that industry which is not something as an animal lover that I want to do so I think that's the main reason why we probably chose to adopt. Her name at the shelter was originally Melanie and we just didn't like it. <laughs> we could appreciate the fact that that was her name but we knew right away that we wanted uh, to change her name. So her formal name is actually Earl Grey, but then uh, I had suggested French Fry and I kind of just forced Kim to agree with it and made it stick and kept calling her that so that she would respond. Um, and now we sometimes call her Smidge. She's got a lot of different names. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a supermodel. She looks like Lady Gaga. <laughs> I'm definitely a crazy cat lady and I love having a cat in our house. It makes college life a little easier and just makes you feel like you always have someone and a friend at home waiting for you. Even if she's totally over it, I'm okay with it. You're like, I can't resist the pets. <laughs> While many animals are adopted every day, there are millions of animals like Ruby who wait a long time for a second chance. A second chance only made possible by shelters and people wanting to save a life. It costs um, about $900,000 to run this place per year, so it's a lot of money. Um, and so again, every penny, every dollar counts and we put it all to really good use. But again, if it wasn't for the generosity of Chittenden and Grand Isle County, we would definitely not be here. So we're really lucky to be in a county that is so passionate about animals and passionate about adopting animals. I plan to adopt more cats in the future. I just think it's really good for people to have pets and companions and french fry has been great and we love her and yes, I would do it all over again. <laughs>Hi Dylan, hi Katie, thanks for joining us. Um, so your piece was so heartwarming. Um, what did you learn about the Humane Society here? I think one of the most interesting things that we learned was the animal transfer transports from the south. Um, we went into this not knowing anything about that and we didn't realize how many animals they actually do get from the south. Mm -hmm. So it became like a huge part of our documentary and I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that definitely was a surprising part for us as well watching it. So what was the most difficult part about filming this piece? Uh, I would definitely say the most difficult part about it was filming the animals in general, because you never really know. Like, uh, Ruby was super energetic and was yeah. like running around. You never knew where she was going to be. And then Melanie, or French fry, was um, uh, super shy, like they said. Mm -hmm. So she was always like trying to hide underneath a chair or a bed or something like that. So. Yeah. 
got to be ready for both extremes. Oh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Thank yeah. you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> this story might really make you think twice if someone tells you they make YouTube videos for a living. It turns out that can be big business. Daniel Mashad knows that. He's a producer of this next piece, and he's a prolific YouTube producer himself. Because of his connections in the YouTube world, Daniel was able to make some connections with very popular content creators, including one who remains very mysterious. Here's Daniel's piece, Behind the You in YouTube. YouTube. It's one of the foundations of the internet. A storage house of content with everything from cat videos to news, movie trailers to music. But for some, it's where they make a living. They are known as YouTubers. They revel in this evolving form of communication and have made it their own. This is a look at three different creators who specialize in video game content. They have different approaches, different personalities, but share a craft in common. Understanding them takes us behind the you in YouTube. Ever ask yourself, why is my character bobbing up and down when I'm not doing anything? Seriously, in real life, if you saw anyone like that on the street, you'd... Well... Let's jump, boy! <laughs> in video games, these are called... Idle Animation! These are the animations belonging to a character when they aren't doing anything. My name is Alex Carducci and my channel's name is Relax Relax. I do gaming content that revolves around information and game design but also has like a humorous touch to it. The main series I'm known for is a series called Know Your Moves and it revolves around Super Smash Brothers, a Nintendo uh, fighting game that has all the characters from Mario, Pikachu, Kirby, The Legend of Zelda and they all fight, and what I essentially do is I talk about the characters, where they're from, and how they're portrayed in this game, because it's, it's a game where a lot of people come together, and they all love it. Uh, average video that's part of the main series, there's the script and research, which can take quite a while. There's, uh, the research can go on for weeks, then I write the script for it, uh, edit the script to make it sound more fleshed out, more flow to it, then I record it, then I begin video editing, capturing footage for the videos, which revolve around playing a couple of video games, uh, and that can take weeks as well. The average video in the editing room could take up to 40 to 60 hours, depending on the length, and the length of my videos range from 10 to 20 minutes, so an average length video on my channel can take to a month. A lot of the time, one of the biggest things people ask you when you're a YouTuber is how do you get paid and how how does this happen? You make videos and you can get paid for it because it's interesting. And what it boils down to is advertisements on YouTube. Those can range from having a little banner on the side of the video or at the beginning of your video, uh, video plays from a sponsor, and all of those help pay the YouTuber making the video. It can get really muddy as to how much you can make per advertisement. But these days, it goes by watch minutes. So if a user is watching through your video for longer, that means that they're being exposed to the advertisement for longer. Thus, they're gonna pay you out more for that view. YouTube pays its content creators roughly about $1 per 1,000 views. However, that $1 amount fluctuates quite a bit depending on the time of the year. Sometimes 1,000 views is worth 50 cents, and sometimes it's worth $7. This is called CPM, which means the cost per 1,000 views. A lot of YouTubers talk about how January is a bad month for getting paid because the CPM is bad. Good months like December where it's Christmas and Boxing Day and people, advertisers are trying to get people to look at their products so they go buy it. That month people are making a lot of money because their advertisements on their videos are doing really good. While only about $1 per 1,000 views doesn't sound like much, According to Social Blade, a website dedicated to the monitoring and projection of YouTubers' viewership and monetary analytics, the top five YouTubers make between $26,000 to $416,000 every single month on average. YouTube's a game at the end of the day. You have to play it or you lose. It's kind of like Game of Thrones. <laughs> 
Now here's the work of another YouTuber. He's called Exploding TNT and his videos are geared for kids. His story includes two big factors. One, his viewership is huge. And two, Exploding TNT's identity is a mystery. Hello, my name is Sam and I'm a 20 year old Canadian guy who loves Tim Hortons. I run a couple of YouTube channels that I started back when I was still in elementary and middle school. The main channel that I run is called Exploding TNT, which is mainly focused on a game called Minecraft. On Exploding TNT, I have around 3.8 million subscribers with almost 1 billion total video views. So one of the craziest things about Exploding TNT is even though he has just under 4 million subscribers over his 5 years of being on YouTube, he has never once revealed his voice or face. While he agreed to an interview, in order to not tip his identity, we decided to have our interview over text, which is being narrated by the voice you heard before. What you see in place of exploding TNT is his own unique persona that he uses to represent himself online. So I'm probably one of the biggest YouTubers that still has yet to reveal myself. I have always been careful with showing myself on the internet from when I was really young, and never really planned to do so. Probably because I've always been a pretty shy person. I obviously wasn't expecting to get to the point where I almost have 4 million subscribers on YouTube, but so far things have gone well without needing to reveal myself so let's just hope it stays that way. So what is Minecraft? If you somehow have never seen this game, think of it as a Lego type of game where you build with blocks, create items, survive, and pretty much do whatever you want, that is the main reason it got so popular, because you can pretty much do anything you want in the game. For my videos, I create little skits using Minecraft. Basically I plan out a creative story that is usually based off Minecraft itself. For example, a lot of my videos start with if such as if Minecraft was a first-person shooter, or if famous people played Minecraft. It can be compared to a cartoon like Spongebob for example. We have those characters that are completely clueless and do wacky things all day, and others that are smarter and more straightforward. The thing that takes the most time in making my videos is the planning brainstorming of the idea. It is usually hard to think of something that you think would be funny enough to entertain possibly millions of kids. I like to write down every single shot and what type of music I will use for that specific scene prior to recording anything to make my life easier afterwards. After that is done, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. I just get some people to act as body actors while I record them, then I edit and that's pretty much it. The entire process usually takes around 20 hours I would say, sometimes shorter if the idea is simple, sometimes longer if I'm having trouble coming up with something. I try to do two videos each week. I'm still learning as I go, I'd like to do more branded videos and have more sponsorships going on, but it is a little bit harder for me because of the type of my content, I have worked with a few companies in the past such as DreamWorks and Loochcrate, so I know how beneficial it can be, I'm happy with the characters I have created and think that I can be successful if I continue to go in this direction. While attending PAX East 2017, a large video game convention for game designers and game fans alike, I got a chance to have an interview with Vinny from the YouTube and Twitch.tv channel Vinesauce. Twitch is a website similar to YouTube, however, it focuses on live video content instead of edited content. Vinny Vinesauce is the owner of three content creating outlets, encompassing two YouTube channels and a channel on the website Twitch.tv where Vinny streams himself live to his viewers at home. You can do it! You can do it, truck! <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Look at this person tub! 
Why is it homing? Why is everything homing, including a bridge? Some of them look a little, uh, I don't know, like they got into a car accident. Like this face right here, that doesn't look much like a face. All right, so I'm Vinny from Vine Sauce. Um, my YouTube channel is Vine Sauce, and I have another one called uh, Vine Sauce Full Sauce, which is just full streams. Um, I've been streaming for seven years. I've been doing YouTube for seven years. And um, generally, I'm known for corruptions, which are forced video game glitches. So, basically breaking video games in such a way that people wonder if it's intentional or not. For me, it's intentional. Um, most people seem to really enjoy that stuff. Uh, the glitches are really popular. There's also, uh, I play really bad games, really weird games. A lot of Mario games, Zelda games. And uh, I'd say it's still, though, glitches. People really like that. Well, I used to make more videos, and you need to have a script. You need to plan. You need to be a little bit more uh, prepared. With editing, you can make even live stuff seem scripted, but these days I'm more into just kind of off the cuff, spur of the moment, and uh, I tend to get my best stuff out of that, and I tend to work better under pressure, and it takes less time overall than actually sitting and writing and then editing. So when you're live, any number of things can go wrong. Internet, the program, the game. Uh, what, 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 what? I'm sorry, what? There's any number of things, and it usually does. But I tell people, if I can, to just hang out and wait, and then, you know, I come back and usually it's fine but you just soldier through it, you make a joke out of it, and you carry on. One of the glaring differences between an edited YouTube video and a live broadcast on Twitch.tv is the chat section. The chat is comprised of a live stream's active viewers, where they can talk and send messages to themselves and the streamer. Sometimes having a live chat is very helpful to the streamer, as it provides immediate feedback to their actions. However, sometimes that live feedback can add a new level of pressure to the content creator. Well, the chat gives a lot of feedback. Um, some of it's extremely unwelcome. Some of it's very good. Yeah, that Vine Sauce stream fucking sucked. Garbage. He played a bunch of fucking garbage tonight. He's not funny. He thinks he's funny. He even gave a fucking chameleon shit posting a voice. It was fucking terrible. Um, a lot of times I will get hints for games I'm playing. They'll tell me about something I never knew. Sometimes they can be extremely informative. Sometimes they can be really nasty. Sometimes they can be extremely malicious. There are times um, I'll be playing a game and they'll, they'll tell me about a thing to go do in the game that's just not real. Um, you kind of have to take the good with the bad when it comes to a giant chat room. So it can be challenging until you learn how to deal with it. And then you have to let the criticisms kind of just bounce off of you. That takes a few years. So I actually hired someone from the community that was an exceptionally good editor. His name is Captain Southbird. He's excellent. I hired him to, um, once a week, uh, cut down some of my full live streams into shorter videos, eight to 10 minutes. And they usually bring in new viewers because you know, attention spans work eight to 10 minutes is perfect. Whereas a two hour full stream, that's a lot harder to pay attention to if you don't know who the guy is. Every night, those live streams get put to one channel, which is the full stream channel, and then um, the cut down videos go to my main channel, which is just called Vine Sauce. And it works out really well. It's a good combo. I would say, in terms of business, um, the split would be about, for both YouTube channels, 60% or more for YouTube, and then maybe 40% for Twitch. These days, it's just so hard. There's like a, a blurring effect where everyone can be a part of it. You know, seven years ago when I started, Twitch did not exist. So it was such a niche audience. You had to kind of forge your own way and you did not get promotion easily. You know, be yourself or be a character, but do either one exceptionally well. Um, and enjoy it. People pick up on if you're not enjoying it. That's, that's one of the things I've learned. If I'm not enjoying a game, my audience knows it. And when I am enjoying the game, it's, it's better for them. Or, conversely, if the game is absolutely terrible, my extreme disgust and hatred for the game usually makes people laugh as well. In a sense, online video content is a massive force with staggering numbers. 
Alex, Sam, and Vinny are just three examples of the 1.3 billion users of YouTube and are just a drop in the ocean that is the 300 hours of video content that is uploaded to YouTube every single minute. But these three individuals are proof that this is something pretty big. This job is one that lets a dedicated video game fan share the fun facts he's dug up about his favorite game with the world. It's a job that lets a person talk for hours and hours to a roaring crowd of words and expressions. It's a job so powerful that a faceless person can produce a 5 minute video that makes billions of kids smile and laugh all around the world. So who's the next hot creator? Well, that's the thing about YouTube. If you put in the work, it might just be you. Hey Dan, thanks for joining us today. Of course. So we just have a couple questions for you. One of them is, how has you being a content creator on YouTube changed the way that you did your interviews for the piece? So I've been on YouTube for five years now and I've been creating content for a little bit longer than that. And while I was on YouTube, I've heard a lot of people who don't fully understand the work that goes into making individual videos. Some videos take up to 20 to 40 hours to make for just 10 minutes of content. Mm -hmm. And I thought that through all my time on YouTube, I made a good amount of, of contacts. This would be a good opportunity to share their story, mm -hmm. to show that there's more to YouTube than just recording gameplay and then just putting it right out. Yep. Yeah, that's really impressive. Um, one of your interviews features a talent that doesn't reveal his identity. What was it like working with someone who wouldn't show their face on, in an interview? So I've known them, Sam, for five years now, and I've been working with him for four years. So our relationship is pretty close. And when I asked him if he'd be, want, if he'd be willing to participate in this piece, he was unsure because he's never once revealed his identity ever in his, in his entire time on YouTube or entire time being online. And so we went into this nego negotiation phase of, can I show your uh, face? No. Can I blur it out? No. Can I show your hands? No. And what we finally concluded on was a text interview over Skype that was to be narrated and animated on screen using his public image for his public uh, personally created character. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was a great improvisation for that. You did a great Thank job. You. Thanks, Stan, for joining Thank us. You. Of course. Earlier we looked at one major industry in Vermont, beer. Now to another, skiing. For many students in Vermont, skiing and boarding are a big attraction, sometimes a factor as to why they go to school here. That's certainly true for Will Davis and Grattan Ryder, the two producers of our next story. They wanted to create profiles of people who work behind the scenes at ski mountains. Not the administrators or owners, rather the folks who show up daily to a snowy resort and keep the place running. Uh, brand new snow pants I'm wearing from last year and I ripped the heels on them pretty bad. But when you love it enough, I don't really mind. The injuries, you know, definitely surprise you sometimes. Sometimes a little more extreme than you think, like concussions, broken femurs, you hear it all. We had several really big snowstorms this year. Ready, Quinn? And all of them, I was out at like 8.30. For years, many of us winter sports enthusiasts, time at the mountain is a place to get away from the daily grind. But this wouldn't be possible without the dedicated employees who beat the sunrise to get the mountain moving. Two seniors from Champlain College went to three different resorts in northern Vermont to learn more about ski areas and the people who keep them running. This is Base Depth. 269 Ranger Grant, visual North Slope. My name is Kyle Pito and I'm a train park ranger here at Stowe Mountain Resort. Here at Stowe, the rangers daily routine Starts with getting here pretty early, uh, rolling out our fences for the entrances of our parks, make sure that all our rails are nice and maintained, looking good. Uh, we design our setups and talk to ski patrol throughout the day to make sure that there's no injuries and things are running smooth. Uh, just keep taking laps through the park, making sure everything's looking good and people are being safe. And at the end of the day, we just roll up fences and call it. 
the injuries, you know, definitely surprise you sometimes. Sometimes a little more extreme than you think, like concussions, broken femurs, you hear it all. Uh, when we have injuries in parks, um, we call down ski patrol if they're not already on scene. And afterwards, we uh, file reports to, you know, kind of detail and outline the incident uh, so that uh, any insurance claims or any liability is kind of not so much waived on our part, but uh, taken care of um, as much as possible. Cold's day I've worked here is probably about negative 40 with the wind chill. Um, gets pretty, pretty gnarly on those days. Uh, one of the best things about working here at Stowe is probably being able to ski pretty much all day, every day that I come to work. So I graduated college at uh, Champlain in uh, the spring of 2016. Uh, I kind of hit the pavement pretty hard looking for a job within my field of uh, business and marketing, but I was kind of not really finding any opportunities that were fitting uh, towards my career goals. So I kind of shifted gears um, and looked for positions in the ski industry, which is an industry I've had a passion for for a long time. And Stowe had a great opportunity open for a terrain park position. So I took it upon myself to apply, got the job, and been happy about it since that happened. Uh, for the future, maybe not always going to be living somewhere I can ski, but you know, you got the internet, you got videos to watch. As long as you're interested and kind of submerged in the culture, you know, skiing is going to be part of your life. I'm Adam Lukowski. I'm the photographer and videographer here at Burke Mountain. I've been working here for about a year and a half now. I got a lot of experience in music, doing live music videos uh, for traveling jam bands. I started with mostly video and here they want pictures heavily. So there I was showing them all these like music videos, like five or six cameras and then they're like, well what about photos, we mostly need like a couple pictures a day. Ever since then the focus really switched from mostly me doing video to now mostly doing photo with some video thrown in there. I really like powder shots. I like going out into the woods and finding natural terrain that's already there as opposed to like terrain park. And I mean I have to I have to go around to everyone. We have a new hotel, I gotta go skiing, mountain biking. So, I mean, it really is a balance of time. Pretty high contrast between oh, lots deep. of fun outdoors and then go sit in your office for like a week. That's one of those things that, you, that I'd never thought of at first was the, the fact that the conditions get so bad and most people aren't taking these cameras out in that. Most of the time, photographers would probably be like, are you crazy like you're going out and dumping snow and it's like you can barely see we've got a lot of great stuff outdoors a lot of beautiful state parks around here a lot of people come out just for the nature itself so there's a lot to really fill your time with there's a there's a process to storytelling and I always was like no I'm a videographer but once I did like enough of these pictures, I was like, this is really interesting. Like, it, what is it that just about a framing and like the composition of a picture that can grab people's attention without them even knowing what that is essentially. Like a lot of people can look at a picture and they're like, wow, that's great. But it takes a lot to actually just get that one second to look perfect. And I think that's another thing I like is that the perfection, like, you can't really, I mean, you can try, but it's like always getting closer and closer to it. Mm -hmm. uh, in peak season, probably two or three times posting a day. We don't want to be bothering them with the content, but we want them to see like, hey, it's pretty cool out today. I mean, I've just I had, I felt adventurous this year. We had a lot of snow. Um, and then, I mean, it got to the point in early February where I realized that the snow is just going to keep coming. I definitely plan on sticking around for at least a little while, a couple of years. Maybe graduate, yep. go on to some bigger mountains, but for now, this is just, just right for me. I'm Chance Lister, been a member of the Bolton Valley Ski Patrol for the past four years. So I tried it out here at Bolton, a lot of mountains. There's a young adult program 
So you can start as young as 15 with the National Ski Patrol, and depending on mountains, uh, protocols, insurance, and everything, you can start patrolling as young as 15. So a normal day, I wake up around 7, and then get to the mountain around 8.30. It's not too long of a drive, I just live around the corner. And then we got a little bit of setup in the morning to do just down in the clinic here. Got to make sure there's no messages. Around 9.30, or 9, and 9.30 we'll ride first chair. We get up to the top of the mountain, we'll get organized, figure out who's going to check all our equipment, make sure nothing's missing, everything's still intact. We'll ride down, everyone will go down a different trail, do trail checks, and once they have everything set, we'll open up to the public. You better go! A lot of people, it's pretty funny, think that we have like half a day's worth of skiing in by the time we actually get up on the lifts, and it's usually just about one run. Pretty funny when you're out there, like I even have friends in lift maintenance and lift ops, and they call me a ski cop. My boss told me not to go off any jumps today doing this. I don't mind, I think it's funny. And it all depends on the kind of person you are when you're out on the hill patrolling. Worst parts about patrolling can be uh, like days like today, it's really cold. We're down at the peak, it's probably about negative 40 with the wind chill. Where on double shifts that I do, I'm in my ski boots for just about 15 hours. And you can't take them off for very long because if something happens, you got to be ready to go out the door. I got new boots this year and they're showing wear like boots I'd had for six years prior. Maybe last year. Um, and I was just going down for dinner. It was like 7 o'clock at night. And we have a lot of school groups here. And they had hit a patch of ice and gone off the side of the trail. And it ended up being a girl against a tree. And it's called a floating knee and she had broke both her femur and her tib and fib down below. So typically for a femur, it's not a splint per se but pain relief where we can use a KTD and actually pull the bone ends apart. And so that way the nerves aren't hitting and makes it a little more manageable for him. We had to put her on a backboard just to get her out of like the tree well she was in. But things like that, at the time, the most important thing to do is just remember to be calm. And in the end, you're like, you know, like have way more of a clear head than I thought. And it's also nice to get something like that done. Cause for me, it was prior to having my jacket I knew like, all right, I can handle something like that. It makes it a little more easy to go into just doing regular patrol full time and kind of know my limits now. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. No the piece was amazing. So Will, what was the hardest part about filming this piece? Um, honestly, I'd have to say uh, with battling the weather constantly mm -hmm. and then simultaneously working with uh, numerous schedules um, from yeah. employees at uh, four different mountains. Mm -hmm. um, to at least one instance where we were with Chance Lister who's ski patrol at Bolton Valley. And rather than recommend that we didn't shoot that day, he actually asked us to pick a different day to shoot because little did we know it was hitting negative 40 at the summit with the wow. wind chill. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's cool. That's, cool. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, so, Grant, what was your favorite part about shooting this piece? I'd say my favorite part about shooting this piece was getting to go to some of the mountains I hadn't gotten to go in the past three, four years of yeah. living in Burlington, Vermont. Um, I got to see a lot of things that I wouldn't typically have seen and got to experience some parts of the mountain that you wouldn't typically see just visiting on your own as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of cool people through the way and I had a good experience. Yeah, that's amazing. What a unique story yeah, for sure. Amazing. Thank you so much guys. Your yeah. piece was really thanks great. Yeah, thanks for having us. If anything, this program gives you some insight into what a few Champlain students are working on. A glimpse into the here and now of the college. But what was it like years ago at Champlain? That's what Dylan Deloge wanted to explore, the history of the institution and how it evolved. Dylan takes us from the past to the present in his story, Champlain College, A History. Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont. It evolved from a two-year business program downtown to a four-year institution on the hill. It went from a handful of students learning to be bookkeepers to 2,400 students preparing for a wide array of professional careers. How did it happen? The history of Champlain has its highs and lows. This is the story of Champlain, a school once known as the Invisible College. Champlain College was founded in 1878 under the name Burlington Collegiate Institute and Commercial College, later shortened to Burlington Business College. It started out as a two-year school for young adults to start a career in business. 
And what we saw was, was in that latter part of the 19th century, a, a big jump in the number of bookkeepers. Between 1800, uh, 1880 and 1900, a lot of, there were all of a sudden a lot of stenographers. And those, I'd say, in the business sector were the biggest uh, dr draws coming in. Secretaries, obviously, of all kinds. As Burlington grew at the turn of the century, the young college did well. We think that Champlain College started out very small with as few as six students in its opening year in 1878. Um, and then grew gradually over time. So by the 19-teens and 1920s, there were about 100 students total, about 50 students in each class. During those years, the school rented several locations in Burlington's downtown district. In 1941, World War II changed the nation. The draft kept many young men out of college. Even after the war, the school struggled to recover its enrollment numbers, while Burlington struggled economically. It was, it was very tough, like Bell Aircraft that uh, had been making these uh, airplane parts, right? uh, they pulled it out of town. That company that was making these uh, packs for parachutes, they pulled out. Uh, Things were very tough in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Probably the worst thing economically that happened to Burlington in 1954, the woolen mills in Winooski shut down. And that was disastrous because they were, at the, by that point, they were the largest private employer in, in Burlington. After the Second World War ended, the GI Bill gets introduced in the United States. So veterans returning from the war, many of them now have the opportunity to go to a four-year college institution where they didn't have that opportunity in the past. So Champlain College suddenly has a lot more competition. Then came a crisis in leadership. In the mid-1950s, the college's owner, A. Gordon Tittimore, had fallen ill. He planned to close the college's doors after a spring semester, 1956. He really saw the college through during the Great Depression and during the Second World War. So by the mid-1950s, when he's nearing retirement, he's faced with a school that has dwindling enrollment and is ailing financially. And he's also in poor health. So I think those factors put together made him less likely to look for a buyer for the college, and more likely to think about just closing do its doors. Enter Clarence Bader Brulette, a successful businessman from Hartford, Connecticut, who moved to Burlington in 1955. Brulette was a member of the local Rotary Club where he met Tittimore. When Brulette heard the school was going to close, he offered to buy it. Soon after, Brulette learned that Albert Jensen, a local insurance agent, had been eyeing the college for a while and had plans of his own to buy it. He met Bader Brulette because he sponsored him to become a member of a local uh, branch of the Shiners. Brulette decided at that point to ask Jensen to join him as a partner, thinking that he could use someone who was rooted in the community, who had been here for a long time, to help him uh, increase student enrollment and manage the college going forward. The first task was to spruce up the space on Main Street in the building now home to Nectar's Restaurant. Brulette and Jensen renamed the school Champlain College of Commerce. Later, it was shortened to simply Champlain College. It was a small, pretty small space. They had one large classroom slash study hall and then another smaller classroom space. Pretty traditional classroom set up with a series of desks that were facing uh, a teacher in the front of the room and blackboards on the walls. Albert Jensen died in December 1956 after suffering two heart attacks that year. This left Brulette to head up the college on his own. Despite the loss, enrollment grew over the next few years and the college quickly ran out of space. Brulette sought a new home for the institution. He decided on the Hill section of Burlington. The first building that Champlain College acquired here in the Hill section was Freeman Hall, which was built in 1903 actually as a carriage barn. Bader Brulette jumped on the chance and moved the entire college up the hill to Freeman, um, which at that point had two floors and a basement level, and it housed the entire operation. The college was now growing in enrollment very quickly. 
To keep the momentum, Brulette knew he had to innovate. His goal was to combine the specialized education of a technical school with the worldview of a liberal arts college. That blend, he thought, would better prepare students for business careers. I think uh, the administration and our professors at the college have to always be in tune with what's happening, happening out there in the marketplace. And if you're not, then you are going to be like those colleges that unfortunately had to close down. And, and there's been two in the greater Burlington area. Brulette made the decision to expand the campus by acquiring Victorian homes on Willard and Maple Streets. The result was a campus that blended into the community. Vermont author Ralph Nading Hill called it the Invisible College. We were so different from the university, uh, from a university setting um, of concrete, square, no character. We had such character in our buildings. I lived in Lyman Hall. Uh, we just, we loved it. It was a hidden campus. Our signage was such that you, lots of times you couldn't even see the signage. So you didn't even know you were in the Champlain in a college setting. For many years that even people in greater Burlington area didn't even know where Champlain was. Regardless, the college continued adding programs and buildings even after Brulette retired in 1977. His successors built on that vision and took the college down the path he laid out. But for many of those years, neighbors of the college were not always happy. The acquisition of buildings in this quiet, affluent section of Burlington had some worried. They didn't want to see their community taken over. Tensions came to a high when Champlain decided to construct more academic buildings in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Neighbors, if they want to, really have the power to if not completely stop you, make, make it very, very difficult. And so when I arrived in 2005, every building that Champlain had done for a decade had been very contentious. For the most part, they all ended up in state environmental court. And in every case, the court ruled in Champlain's favor, but it was always a two or three year process and cost a lot, cost the college a lot in terms of uh, legal fees. Not to mention just, you know, time, time wasted. But there was a need for more academic space and a need for a new approach. In 2006, we, uh, we set about creating a campus master plan and we involved literally uh, hundreds of neighbors in creating that plan. We talked about what we wanted to do in making the, making the campus much more residential and um, we asked neighbors for their input. And so now it's been, uh, I don't know, probably close to 10 years where uh, the college has had no challenges, no legal challenges from neighbors. But it is like any relationship, it's something that requires constant attention and you know, the people at the college need to be open to and continue to communicate with the neighbors. The campus had changed a lot since its move to the hill in 1958. It went from being just one former carriage barn to include residence halls, an auditorium, a library, and multiple academic buildings. But perhaps the biggest change from the Brulette years was the introduction of four-year programs in 1992. At first, the reason was economic. Newly created Community College of Vermont posed a challenge. President Skiff uh, and the board at the time then um, saw the community college as a, a threat to Champlain's ability to maintain enrollments. And so uh, they decided the best way forward would be to begin to sort of slowly offer uh, a number of baccalaureate degrees. And they began in, uh, in uh, business and then a little bit later accounting and, and it sort of grew from there. By the time I arrived in 2005, virtually uh, every program had, uh, had a, a baccalaureate component to it. I think Champlain's secret sauce since 1878 has been our connection to the business community and to nonprofit organizations. We've always been asking what do those companies need to be successful? And today, what we are hearing is they want students who graduate as 
skilled practitioners, effective professionals, and engaged global citizens. This is why Champlain has been able to go from a small school renting a couple rooms in downtown Burlington to a four-year institution with a reputation for producing high-quality graduates. Arguably, Champlain finds itself in a similar place from the year it was founded, searching for ways to be relevant in a changing marketplace and giving students critical thinking tools and professional skills to succeed. When I arrived at Champlain, I interviewed almost 100 faculty, staff, and students um, about what they thought about Champlain and what they loved about Champlain. And one of the themes that came from that is that we're nimble, we're entrepreneurial, uh, we react very positively to changes in the market. And if you think about the higher education field as a market, it is incredibly competitive these days. And I spend a lot of time thinking about how Champlain is positioned in that marketplace so that we can continue to thrive. Champlain's history, a span from the 19th century to the 21st, is a mix of early success, economic hardship, and constant innovation. The invisible college on the hill is anything but invisible, an evolving institution with a vision for the future. So you had a lot of old photos in your piece. How did you get them? Um, that mostly involved going to Champlain's Special Collections Department, which is in the library. And they have like an index, pretty much, of everything they have on file, which is extensive. And I go through, I pick which folders I want to look at, and then I go through the folders uh, one image at a time and uh, find which ones I want. And then they have a high-resolution scanner, and they would scan it for me. So they came out looking very good on video. Oh, super convenient for your piece. Yeah, yeah, they were at like 600 DPI or something like that, so that was really wow. nice. Yeah, That's great. So what was one thing about Champlain that really stood out to you during your research for this piece? I think it was how much the campus changed over time. It was a lot different, not even like 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, a lot of buildings have been built very recently, and seeing the college during that transition is very interesting. Um, the college was a lot more green then too, um, just a lot more grass and trees around. So although that makes me a little sad, I like very much appreciate the buildings we have now. Mm -hmm. Sounds really beautiful. That's our program. Thanks so much for watching Champlain Presents. And special thanks for RETN for all your help and support on our projects. We couldn't do it without you. I'm Mae Sullivan. And I'm Tyler Jennings Pesca. Thank you.